The gospel is, is truly amazing, amazing. And as we work through the book of Romans, we, we get this, this beautiful picture. Uh, Paul took time to explain the gospel and its fullness and what it was expected of us. It's all there. I, I just want to review a little bit so that we, we're, again, we're getting the, the larger picture. I know it seems like we're rushing through uh, Romans, but to get the, the bigger picture, it's, it's good for us. Uh, at times to take larger chunks. The, the first 17 verses, uh, Paul introduces the gospel, and there's, there's two truths there uh, that, is, that is very key to all that he's going to say. One is that it is the gospel that is the power of God in salvation. It's not by works, it's not by uh, a church, it's not by any other means, it is the gospel, the good news of God's grace. Uh, and secondly, he says very clearly that salvation is by faith. Again, uh, it is not uh, something that we do. It is something that we believe. In 118 over to 320, and, and you know uh, that when the, when the Gospels, when these letters were written, uh, there were no verses and chapters, okay? So don't be troubled that sometimes it breaks differently uh, than you think it would. Uh, the, the verses and chapters, or the chapters and verses were added later just to enable us to find things. But this was all one letter. So in the next large section, uh, Paul talks about how much we need the gospel. You cannot find the goodness of God and the grace of God until you first recognize your need for the gospel. And so he spends quite a bit of time uh, talking about it. The, the, the falling away from God. And what is really important to understand in that section is where it began. Mm -hmm. They knew there was a God. They looked at the world around them and they knew there was a God, but they failed to acknowledge him. And secondly, they failed to give thanks. And whenever we find ourselves in a situation where uh, it looks like there's no God <laughs> and, and we're troubled by that and when we begin to stop thanking him we, we fail to acknowledge his presence uh, I'm, I'm delighted sometimes to be around people who have very uh, strong illness and, and uh, the reason is that when they recognize that every day is a gift they wake up and thank God for it. And I think how many years of my life did I just wake up saying, yeah, oh yeah, of course I'm alive today. Yeah, of course uh, I have all these privileges and all this. It's good for us to remember that there were people uh, on 9-11 that went to work and never came home. It is good for us to remember that there were people in the Ukraine who have no home to go back to. It's been totally dis destroyed by rockets and bombs and shells. It is good for us to remember uh, that though we all have aches and pains, uh, at least when you get my age, you do, okay? That there are people that can barely breathe and there are people that are struggling for life. We need to acknowledge and give thanks to God. In the next section, uh, chapter three, Verse 21 until the end of the chapter, if you could only have one section of the Bible, that's the section you should have. For it is so clearly laid out there that salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, he died for us. And through faith in him, we have forgiveness of sins and we have a newness of life. Chapter 4 is all about an example. The example was important because of the Jews thought that Abraham lived by the law. They needed to be reminded that the law came 400 years after Abraham. They thought, oh, they were a chosen race because they had this covenant with God that was marked by circumcision. And they needed to understand that it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous before that covenant. They needed to remember that it was Abraham who came to a place in his life after God had promised him a son, 
that it became impossible, humanly speaking. He was 75 when the promise came. He was 100 when the promise was fulfilled. And his wife uh, was 90. There was no human possibility for them to have a child. And it says, instead of giving up his faith, he began to give glory to God. What a great pattern for us. Are there times when you feel like giving up? Maybe that's the very time you need to praise God. Abraham uh, was made right not by works, not by ritual, certainly not by law. And then in chapter 5, there's this great listing of all the benefits we have. But by faith, we are able to come into the very presence of God. By faith, uh, we have peace with God. By faith, we have this newness of life that the world can't understand. The world is, is sometimes scratches their heads and says, what's wrong with these Christian people? Don't they understand how bad things are? How can the martyrs go to their deaths singing and praising God? How could uh, those who have faced calamity in life have peace and go on? One of my favorite songs uh, it, it is, It is Well With My Soul. And you know the story of that song. It, it, was, a, it was a man who walked his, his wife and his children at sea, and, and he came later and, and he told the captain, let me know when we reach that place. And it was there, grieving for his wife and his children. Not, he wasn't happy about that, but it was there he realized, it is well with my soul. My soul can be uh, at peace even in calamity. And so those first five chapters, the, the gospel is so well explained and laid out. You can expect then that the critics would come, and the critics came. The critics wanted to take things to one side or to the other. There were those who said, okay, if God is a God of grace, then it doesn't matter what we do. We can just go on sinning. In fact, it makes God look good if I'm a real bad sinner because he's forgiven me. That's called license. And there are people who, who say, well, you know, I, I can just do whatever I want. It's certainly not lined up with what the scripture says. And so, uh, Paul addresses that in chapter 6. And he said, the question is, shall we go on sinning because the grace is so great? And he says, no, don't you understand you're dead to sin? Don't you understand you don't have to serve sin anymore? You're free from it? You were buried with Christ in baptism, raised with him to a new life? You were free because it's a gift that God has given you. You don't have to be dominated by sin. And then the, the other side comes in. Those who say, well, yes, that's right. We must live by law. We must carefully watch this and watch that and do this. And they miss the joy. They miss the, 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 all that God wants us to enjoy. Uh, and so the question is, shall we live by the law? And the answer is no. And in this chapter, chapter 7, we're going to kind of zip through it. Uh, today so that we can understand uh, that we died to the law as well. We died to sin and the old principles. We died to the law as well. We are free to be ourselves because of the grace of God. We can, we can serve him fully. We can bring forth a harvest of good deeds. We are free because salvation is a gift. We are free because Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives. So let me read the first six verses of chapter 7. It reads like this from the New Living Translation. Now, dear brothers and sisters, and, and we'll come back to that. I want you to note that. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So dear brothers and sisters, 
This is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died to Christ. And now you are unified with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds. When we were controlled by our old nature or sinful nature, sinful desires were at work within us. The law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, resulting in death. But now we've been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way, by obeying the letter of the law, but in a new way of living in the Spirit. Living in the Spirit. That, that's what is offered to us. And so he gives a, a legal principle. Uh, law is binding only during life. Okay? Um, and he gives the example of a, of a wife being married. But if her husband dies, nobody says, oh, what's wrong with her? She's marrying someone else. It, it is fully legal and okay. She's not bound anymore because of the death. The application is wonderful. <laughs> we are united with the one who was raised from the dead. We are united with him, and we can serve God in a new way. The letter of the law leads to death, but the life in the spirit is full of joy. And, and he mentions that it was, it was the law that, that raised up and revived uh, the, the sin, that we understood it. It doesn't mean that law caused it. It means that law exposed it. And in the next section, from 7 uh, to 14, he talks about the ministry of the law. It reveals sin. He said, for example, covetousness. I didn't know that it was wrong to want something my friend had or my uh, neighbor had. Uh, until I read the law and I realized, ah, oh, that, that is sin. God doesn't want me to be focused on what belongs to someone else. The law revives the sin. I, I knew that I was being drawn to that and yet I was couldn't stop myself and, and it became alive in me. It reproves sin. It was I was deceived and I was led to my death. And then he says, I don't want you to misunderstand. The law is holy, right, and good. Nothing wrong with the law of God. And when he talks about the law of God, he's talking about the moral law, not the, not the little uh, uh, cultural laws that they served in the, in the Old Testament. But the Ten Commandments, the, the cultural law, now when, uh, the, the moral law, law. When Jesus was on the earth, he took the ten and he boiled them down to two. He said, they said, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That takes care of the first four pretty easily. And then he said, and love your neighbor as yourself. That takes care of the other six. So all of them can be lumped into those two. Jesus said, I am come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. So the law is good. It's holy. It's right. Uh, and, and the question then comes up, did that which is holy and good cause death? The answer again is no. And when he answers these objectors, uh, he, he uses the strongest negative. Uh, it's interesting to read different translations and to see no, never, not, absolutely not. What you, it's the strongest negative. In, in the Greek, it's a double negative. But in, in English, that would be a positive, so we don't do it that way. Uh, it is no, absolutely not. It cannot be so. Uh, the law reveals, revives, reproves, but it cannot remove sin. And then he begins to talk about the inability of the law. And I'm going to begin pick up reading again in verse 13. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read 13 to 17. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin used, uh, used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. 
So we can see how horrible, how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good command for its own evil purpose. So the trouble is not the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself for what I want to do. I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate, but if I know that I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree with the law, that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong, it is sin living in me that does it. Reading through verse 17. So he is saying, the law reveals sin, but the law cannot change us. It, it, it does not enable us to do the right thing. It only shows us what's wrong in our life. And the old nature, the nature that we're born with, has sway in our life until it is put to death with Christ. There are psychologists that, that very scholarly writing say, we are all born neutral when we come into this world. And I have told you before, those people don't have children. <laughs> because if they had children, they would understand uh, we don't come into this world neutral. None of you have taught your children to, how to be deceptive. You know, it's not something we teach our kids. Maybe later on somebody taught them how to pick pockets or something, but that's not what you do with little kids. None of you teach your children how to be selfish. You don't know, say, look, now when those other kids come over here, don't let them touch your toys. You don't teach your kids that, but they know it. <laughs> they know it. I, I'm, I'm convinced that the first word that children uh, say that they really understand is mine. <laughs> you know, we, we always say, oh, no, they say mama and papa first. They're just making sounds, okay? Um, you can disagree with me if you want. But, but when a kid sees somebody get something that's his and he grabs it and says mine, he understands what he's saying. We came into this world with the nature of Adam. Adam was created with the image and the nature of God. But Adam sinned, and every person born after that was born with this bent to sin. The old nature, the sinful nature. It's, it's got lots of names in the gospel. Listen to some of the verses that he says here. I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Verse 19, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Verse 21, when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Verse 25, in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. Now, you might think, well, chapter 7 is really a down chapter, but we need to understand there's a lot of very positive teachings in chapter 7. It's very positive for us to understand that you're dead to the law. You're not under the obligation of the law. It's even more wonderful to think that you are married or united with Christ, and therefore you can produce a harvest of good deeds. The law reveals sin. You know, I've often said to people, you know, pain is good. And, and usually people say, what? Say what? Pain is good? Have you ever read or known someone that didn't have pain? It's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous situation. Because if you don't know something's wrong, you go right on harming yourself. That's one of the elements of leprosy is it kills the nerve endings. And people damage their finger, they pick up pot, <clears throat> pots, burn themselves, they don't feel it because they have no more feeling. Pain alerts us to the fact that something's wrong. So the conviction for sin is good. It's good when, when God says no. You know, it's, it's good when parents love their kids. If they love their kids, they say no. You can't play in the street. No, you're not to have a sharp knife. 
<laughs> on one of our trips early, early on when we were here, we went to Switzerland. And so the boys thought, wow, I want a Swiss Army knife. And, and we gave in and gave them, bought them a Swiss Army knife. And they were looking at it and playing with it. And, and I said, be really careful, it's really sharp. And John said, oh, it doesn't look so sharp. <laughs> he slid his, his thumb right down like, a, oh, it is sharp. <laughs> the pain helped him to remember that knife is sharp. We need God's pain to come upon our lives so that we understand that he loves us. He says no. Deliverance over sin is provided through Jesus Christ. I want to read uh, the last uh, four verses, five verses here. So in chapter 7, go down with me to 21. I've discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another power, or another law, some, some versions read, within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is in the dominated by sin and death. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because I'm in sinful, my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. I'm a slave to sin. Uh, the law is like a mirror. It reveals my flaws, but it cannot change them. Now, this is a very intriguing chapter uh, because if you go into uh, the history of theology, you're going to find scholars that say, obviously, this person in chapter 7 is not a believer at all. And they will quote these scriptures that I've read about. I want to do right, but I don't do it. And then you can look on the other side and you will find scholars who say, well, look, wait a minute. Uh, he wrote to brothers and sisters. This person says, I love the law of God. How could anyone say that if they weren't really a believer? Guess what? I'm not going to solve that problem for you today because I think it misses the point. I, I'm convinced it misses the point. In chapter 6, Paul dealt with license, the idea that I can just go on sinning. And God doesn't care about it because his grace covers it. That's so far from the scripture, what the scripture says. We are called to be holy because he is holy. We are called uh, to walk in obedience. On the other side, there are those who want to live by legalism. I've earned my way into heaven. I can be there because, because I have done what is right. And that's wrong. Too. <laughs> Both sides are wrong. I, I think that what he is saying here is that all of us struggle at times and have the same feeling. Before you came to Christ, uh, it was the Holy Spirit that convicted you of sin. And you came to a place in your life that you recognized what a wretched sinner you were. Paul, in his writing, said, I am the worst of sinners. And I think most of us uh, felt that way when we came. Yeah, you say, well, but I was saved when I was young. I had never killed anybody or robbed a bank. It doesn't matter. You still knew that you were separated from God because of your sin. And until you come to that realization, you can't really be saved. As long as you think, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm not as bad as him or her. As long as we're comparing ourselves with others, we're not going to get any grace from God. But when we come to the realization that I have sinned and I am separated from God, that's what death is all about. Death in the Bible is separation. Separation. And, and the wages of sin is death. And unless we have the grace of God through Jesus Christ, we're all going to be separated from God for eternity. 
Some people say, well, how can God send nice people to hell? God doesn't send any nice people to hell. First of all, there's no nice people. <laughs> You're full of sin. And secondly, God only allows you to take what you, the path you have chosen. You've chosen the path and you reject his and you reject giving him thanks and he allows you to go. We're in a battle. We're in a battle. And there are those uh, that, that say, okay, but once I pray that prayer, it's, it's all okay. I can do whatever I want. That's the license. And there are others that say, oh, no, you've got to be careful every day. You've got to read your Bible every day. You've got to be to church every Sunday. We'd be in trouble here, wouldn't we? <laughs> I'm not going to be in church the next two Sundays. Actually, I'm going to be in church. I'm going to be in church with 500 people next, uh, next Sunday. Uh, but um, and, and the next Sunday after that, probably 1,200. Well, they won't all be there, but it'll be a church open for them. Uh, but it's not by good deeds that we're going to get our, our way in. There's a battle that goes on. And when I recognize my sin and I ask God to forgive my sin, that's not the end. That's the beginning. Then I begin to walk with him. These feelings, these conclusions, they catch up with me again and again. Uh, if you've never felt this way, then I praise God. <laughs> but I think we've all felt like, at times, like, no, I want to do this, but I don't do it. I want to spend more time in prayer, but I just don't do it. I want to read my Bible more, but I just don't do it. And, and those other things, being greedy or being hateful towards someone or, or uh, being prejudiced towards someone, I don't want to do that. I don't want that in my life, but somehow it's there. And we need to understand that we are miserable until we recognize that we need God every day in our life. Every day in our life. What should we do? Exactly what Paul did. He called out to God. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? That's the beginning. It's confession. It's opening ourselves up to God. Whether you're, it's the very first time or whether you've been walking with God and you realize that you've fallen into a, a, a course that's taking you the wrong way or, or whether it's something that you realize this is where I need to be going. I'm not going to get in there. It doesn't matter where it is. When those feelings come, we need to just open ourselves up and say, Oh God, here I am. I'm miserable. Free me. Who is going to free me from this? And then hear the answer from heaven. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is not uh, some action that I did. It is not some discipline that I have. Is, is it wrong to do that action? No, you have to begin. Is it wrong to have discipline in your life and read your Bible and, and to work at having prayer every day? No, that's wonderful. That's good. But recognize that those are not the things that save you. It is the gospel that is the power of God to salvation. It is the gospel that brings us back again and again and again. I'm convinced of it. Again and again and again. We have to hear, thank God, the answer is in Christ Jesus. The answer is in Christ Jesus. Would you bow your hands with me? I think every one of us here, we've, we've, we've gone through these cycles. We've been there with Paul and said, the things I, I hate, I keep on doing. And maybe, maybe right now, some of you are stuck in that. And you're saying, oh, I'm a hypocrite. I say I'm a believer, but I'm still stuck in doing some things I don't want to do. I, I, I know I should, what I should be doing, but I, I'm not doing that. And as long as we grapple with those things in our own strength, we're miserable. And we cry out with, with Paul, what a miserable person I am. 
who will deliver me? You see, it's not what. It's not a method. It's not a church. It's not a, a doctrine. It's a who. Jesus Christ. Let me pray with this. Father, you know our hearts tonight. And I can't help but believe that there's some people right here that are kind of caught in that dilemma. Maybe they've never started out the journey with you and, and your Holy Spirit is dealing with them and drawing them to you. Lord, I pray that they would cry out. I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Maybe there's some here that have walked with you a long time in their life and they're still striving and attempting by their own good deeds to be pleasing to you. And they need to recognize, I'm not going to do it in my strength. And Father, they're crying out and saying, oh Lord, I need deliverance tonight. I need to know the answer. Who will deliver me from this dominance of sin? They need to hear you clearly in their heart, saying, thank God, through Jesus Christ, there is deliverance. And Father, as we lay those things out before you, and we hear your sweet voice, we rejoice in you. It is not to us that the praise comes. It is to you, Lord. It is not uh, in our strength that we walk this road of faith. It is in your strength. It is not by our good deeds. It is by the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And as we grasp hold of that truth, whether it's for the first time or the 101st time, our hearts are peaceful again. And we praise you that you are ever present, that you are ever faithful to the cry of the brothers and sisters crying out to you. We thank you, Father. We praise you that in Christ Jesus there is deliverance. There is salvation. There is life everlasting. There is abundance and joy in this life, even now. Thank you, Father. We pray it in Jesus' wonderful name.